Hello, and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. And I'm Rosie Murphy, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We are watching Season 4, Episode 2, Confirmed Dead. This is the episode with the introduction of the freighter team. And we have the second part of an interview with Rebecca Mader, who, of course, appears for the first time in this episode as Charlotte Lewis. Let's do it. Confirmed Dead. We start each episode of The Hatch with our hot takes about, uh, about the week's episode. Uh, Rosie, what's your hot take on Confirmed Dead? Yeah, so we, we kind of alluded to this. We got into this a little bit last week, but I kind of wish that this had been the season premiere. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. It, it does, you know, we talked about in, in last week's episode the classic premiere thing of kind of exploring a new cast of characters and introducing kind of a big important shift in the narrative. Um, you know, introducing some very important new information at the top of the season that we're going to, like, reckon with in the coming episodes. And in this case, that would be, like, oh, crap, the whole world thinks that the oceanic passengers were dead this whole time. It introduces these four characters in a really compelling way and would in that they each get, like, a brief flashback. And I don't know, man, I think this is, like, you know, we talked about the idea that beginning of the end feels like a weird kind of coda to the season three finale. And I feel like this is where... It, it kicks off properly. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. There's, um, there's stuff, I think, because I was thinking about the same thing, and there's stuff in the beginning of the end that happened that I think needs to have happened in the premiere. Like the Jack right. Locke confrontation immediately following the supposed death of Naomi. Like that, that you know, Jack putting the gun to Locke. So that was a scene that needed to be in the season premiere and not, you know, like pushed off into the future. But, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, arguably, you know, Kate finding Naomi in the jungle, like, could she have survived longer than that? But but could you have worked that stuff into, you know, an episode that starts with the freighter team landing? Like, I think you probably could have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, rather than, I mean, we liked, on the whole, I think we liked the Hurley flash forward and everything that happened in the last episode. But, like, this is what I want from a season premiere. Yeah, like, I mean, Hurley... Oh, two thoughts. One, Hurley, you know, his big emotional, um, you know, speech about, you know, Charlie died to give us this message, so I'm going with Locke and that whole split up. I, I feel like that probably could have waited until the second episode. Like, if you had wanted yeah. to do that, you probably could have drawn that out longer. Um, but secondly, just to, to further agree with you, I mean, that first sequence this episode that starts with yes. the underwater you know, drone camera and finding Oceanic 815 and the... Oh, the it's, ver- so, it's so creepy and it's so good and it does exactly what the the opening sequences of the two and three premiere do, which is like introduce, like drop you into a world you don't recognize. Right, and, and the introduction of Faraday as well. Uh, you know, I, I guess yeah. it, it's technically not his introduction here because he appears at the end of the previous episode, but it... I mean, it very well could and, and should be. Um, and, and, and like you said, just like seasons two and three premiere, I mean, season two blows your mind with, oh shit, you know, Desmond, is, there's this dude in the hatch and he's mm-hmm. living in there. And season three, it's, oh shit, the others have this village and you introduce Juliet. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the same concept here with a scene that like totally turns things upside down. Like they found the plane at the bottom of the ocean. Like granted, Naomi told us that last year. But it's a whole other level to see it and to realize right. that you know life is really continuing out there surrounding this, like to really know that. Right. And in, in you know, but at the end of season one and beginning of season two, we knew that there was the hatch and we knew that there was something. In, you know, it, it wasn't like, right. you know, we knew that the others existed and we knew that they lived in somewhere to take <laughs> the start of season three. You know, it's, it's like we've always got to work off some seed that's been planted. But right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally with you. Confirmed Dead as season premiere would have been awesome. Anyway, what's your hot take? Um, so while I while I do have other thoughts about the freighter people, which which we'll get into, I, I just wanted to hot take a bit about Locke's leadership here um, and how I think that he is just immediately being a poor leader to his new group of people. Like, mm-hmm. for all of this time, Locke has been in the shadow of Jack as the leader for the first, you know, three years of this show. And now Locke, you know, finally has, you know, his own followers that they've split off from Jack. He's in charge. The first thing he does is tell them they're going to the barracks and then without telling them leads them somewhere else, only to be called out on this when Sawyer notices they're going the wrong direction. And then when asked who's he getting his orders from, he tells them it's Walt. What the hell do you mean you saw Walt? In a dream? No dream, it was Walt. Only 
taller. Taller? What, like a giant? And granted, yes, that's what yeah. happened. And I, I get that that's probably there somewhat for an expository purpose of explaining that, you know, there was more to his conversation with Walt that we didn't see last year. But right. also, like, I'm watching that scene and thinking, like, what the fuck are you doing, Locke? Like, do you want them to think you're batshit insane? Like, these people all just agreed to, you know, like, follow you away from rescue. And you're telling them that you're that you're following the orders of a kid who's not on the island who appeared to you as, like, a ghost? Like, what the hell? Right, who no one has seen in months at this point. Right, show, show some judgment here. And even if that's what you're doing, don't tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, also oh, maybe geez. don't do it, but certainly don't tell them. Yeah, and he does it in this way. It's like in this scene where he drops several bombs, which is that, you know, Ben shot me, but Ben is still with us and he's here as a resource. I, I ran into Walt and he told me where to find where, find this cabin, which, by the way, the thing we're looking for is a cabin, which, by the way, Hurley knew, appears to know about as well. Um, yeah, it's not a, not a great job. I think we talked about this last week with... Jack takes his role as a leader very seriously and that he knows he kind of needs to manage the group's emotions. Um, Whereas John kind of seems to do the opposite. Yeah. Oh, dear. (laughs) Yeah, so that's that's, uh, my hot take for the week. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good one. Where um so now that we've we've you know we've done our hot takes where uh, where would you like to begin with the rest of this uh, truly wonderful episode? My opinion. Oh, it is a truly wonderful episode. So action-packed episode and a lot of action like it's the action's consistent throughout and i think that's great but i I think i'd like to start with our um freighter four and their little flashbacks yeah for sure um which are are very brief but you know basically we meet them all you know we meet them on the island and then we find out where they were when they learned that oceanic 815 had been found um and they all seem to know instinctively or in the case of Frank Lapidus have some amount of evidence, you know, they know something about this isn't true, which is, is great. Cause it kind of tells the viewer right up front that like something's fishy here. Yeah. Um, but you know, we, not we that we don't know that, something's fishy because we know that's not the real plane. Cause we've been watching the survivors for three years, but yes. <laughs> well, yes, but we know, you know, we can, we can dismiss, okay. They, they haven't been dead the whole time. Right. Right. Like, for sure. Is, <laughs> um, yeah. Like, you know, Charlotte is, kind of bribing her way into this archaeological dig when her her guide or friend or translator asks her, like, how many times are you going to read that headline before you believe it's true? Um, or in how many languages? And she says, how many languages are there? It's a great um, line. It's you, a great first line for that character. It, it really is. Technically not her first line because of the helicopter scene, but you, yeah, point, point taken. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's They all have this access to this kind of secret knowledge, and I don't... You know, we we find out later that it's because they all have some connection to the island, but it's great. Yeah, it's sowing some great seeds. No, for sure. And you know, for and uh, we'll just say just for for clarity's sake here, Miles Strom does not know that he has any connection to the island. The right. and 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 Frank Lapidus has a connection to the airplane rather than to the island. But yeah, it's right. It's 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 definitely really compelling to bring in these four new characters, who all there is more than meets the eye to all of them. And the show sort of tells you right away, like there's something going on with each of these people. It's mysterious mm-hmm. and interesting. And on top of that, they're all very interesting. They're all fun characters just of their own mm-hmm. right. Yeah. And they're, they're not scary in any way. They, it very quickly makes them non-threatening. Yeah. I think, I think the show really quickly establishes that like these people aren't your enemies. Right. Well, there's, um, this is not a word that I that is like generally in my parlance, but it's what came to mind watching the scenes. Miles is such a dick, um, but like in a really in in a weirdly endearing way. Like I found myself watching this episode, and like the first scene where he's like playing dead on the bluffs, like, and he he you know pops up and sticks the gun in Jack's face. Like you know you know we've seen this, so you know it's coming. But I'm waiting for that, and like, oh my god, I can't believe he's about to do this. And then I cracked up when he did it, because it's, it's such a dick move. Well, um, and he's, the first thing he says to Jack is, back up, handsome. <laughs> Which is funny. very actually, funny. I didn't, even, I didn't even realize that he calls him handsome. <laughs> it is. No, and, then, and then in the, I mean, in the flashback, and, and I actually have a hindsight about the flashback, which I'm going to keep in my back pocket for now. But the, um, you know, he, 
he's clearly like he's exploiting this poor grandmother and he mm-hmm. doubles the price even though as we quickly learn like there's really no reason for that he just came up with an excuse to charge her even more he he counts out every $20 bill right in front of her he he gives no fucks about that mm-hmm. and then he goes up to the room you know steals the kid's money tells him very coldly you can go now um which is just a real you know cold and uncaring line but then he feels that like that little bit of guilt when he sees the the kid's picture on the wall and he's like oh shit this is like a real person and he he doesn't give her back all the money even though he just made way more but he gives her back half of it um which is just yeah. like he you know he has so you can tell there's a little bit of human you know human feeling in him but not but not that much at least not yet i don't know there's just something weird and and you know he has some laugh lines on the island too like when they're you know they're like I'm a physicist i mean i guess you can call me a physicist I don't really like being pigeonholed in the one. Dan, I swear to God, you say one more word, I'm going to break your fingers. And what do you do, Miles? I collect soil samples. Well, that's nice. Well, maybe you can help me. You say you're not here on a rescue mission, and the world at large believes us to be dead. But here we are, alive and well, and you don't seem remotely surprised to see us. Oh, my God. You guys were on Oceanic Flight 815. Wow. That's better. I don't know. He, he's a jerk to everyone the whole time, but I also kind of find it endearing in a weird way. And maybe that's Ken Lung's portrayal of the character. Yeah, I, I don't think it's super fair to include his conversation with the ghost in that. <laughs> because a man's a ghost hunter. Like, I don't, I'm not going to critique how he does his job. Maybe that's the way you have to speak to a ghost to get them to go. But the rest of it, fair enough. Oh, yeah, and he, it, it, it tracks, I think, that he ends up being Sawyer's partner in that in that um, flash sideways where they're both um, in the LAPD, right? Because they're both oh, kind of lovable jerks. But, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I was just surprised because I didn't remember Miles making such an impression on me so quickly. But watching this episode, I was like, oh, like, I'm really ha- excited to see Miles on the screen, you know, like, making me laugh and doing, you know, jerky things to people. Like, it was it was fun. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. As far as the other characters, um, obviously Daniel Faraday, beloved. They're all beloved, but um, oh yeah, Faraday. In Daniel's case, he doesn't really get a flashback. Like we see him sitting in front of the TV screen, kind of terrified. Um, but that's that's pretty much it, right? We don't see a scene of him in normal life. No, just just um, that one. It was much shorter than the other flashbacks. Right. But, however, we get a lot from him on the island where he explains that he's a physicist and, you know, we're not exactly here to rescue you. And he's pretty open about the information he's willing to share, I guess, because he's a scientist and he's interested in answering the bigger questions. And, and, it, and he's know, a terrible liar. As enemies. And he's a terrible liar and, like, not trained for this. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I did think it was interesting that he he gave that away so quickly, you know, rescuing you is, can't really say it's our primary objective. Like, there's that whole scene, like, I think it's in the shape of things to come later this year, where it's this big dramatic moment where Jack is like, were you ever going to take us off this island? And and he says, no. He says no. And it's like, oh, but he kind of told you that right here in the premiere, or (laughs) almost the premiere. Like, were you not paying attention, Jack? Like, (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I also I also thought of how Gene Higgins told us last year that that Jeremy Davies was such a mumbler and even though it was part of his acting technique that she always had to tell him to speak up. Like Yeah. I I loved his delivery of um <laughs> when they find that like the biohazard materials in the box and they look at him Jack and Kate like what the you know what the hell is this stuff? He's like um uh, I'm not in charge of uh, packing so <laughs> Right. Uh, no way of knowing. <laughs> No, Jeremy Davies is great. And then we've got Charlotte, um, who of co- who immediately establishes herself as like this rogue anthropologist, right? Who bribes her way into this dig site and makes l- arguably the most interesting. Dis- all the flashbacks are great, but arguably the most interesting is that she finds the polar bear skeleton with the Dharma collar. Yeah, which you know ties in somewhere to this idea that things can travel back and forth from the island not necessarily in real time. Uh, oh, yeah, it's a big, like, it's a big reveal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a very, it's never spoken about. You know, it happens, and then you just kind of have to sit with that as the viewer and think about, like, well, what, 
huh, what yeah. on earth would that old, old like, bones of a polar bear be doing there? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and it's, it's something you can't really guess at because we have no conception of, you know, the moving of the island and the wheel. But, it, I mean, the payoff right. is so good. Yeah, um, yeah, and of course we season. get... And we're already getting hints of, like, the events of The Constant, right? When they try to reach George Minkowski and he can't come to the phone, which presume, I, I assumed was because he was having one of his flashes. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Which will later kill him. Um, yeah, yeah, because he, he tried to, you know, take a little little dinghy to the island and got too close and his mind started flipping out, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. And the flashbacks are helpfully ordered in a level of mystery, I think. So we kind of build up to the big reveal of Frank Lapidus where he calls Oceanic and says that's that's not the real pilot. I was, you know, I know that man, I was supposed to be flying the plane. But, you know, Miles has nothing to do with the island. He's just hearing the news on the radio right. and then Charlotte finds the Dharma collar and then Frank, I, I don't know. It's very nicely done. It is. And I love the... Um... I also love the the frenetic energy when they're running around the island looking for each of them. Like, Mm -hmm. Michael Giacchino's score in those moments is really, really good. It just has this, like, jumpy, like, ooh, we got to do this and we got to do that. And, you know, oh, is he over there? Is she over there? Like, it just, it it gives the episode, like, a a, a great, you know, sort of forward motion of trying to find these people. Um, Before we move on from the flashbacks, two quick things. One, Mm -hmm. just about the polar bear um, I was watching that as well and thinking not just about the payoff, but thinking, gee, this must mean that Dharma, since the 70s, had those polar bears move the island, um, or at least on one occasion. And I, I looked it up on Lostpedia because I wondered if that was ever addressed, and I'd forgotten it's addressed briefly in The man, the New Man in Charge, the sort of epilogue that was included on the season six DVD where Hurley goes to visit Walt, and there's one more Dharma video that gets shown in that. And uh-huh. in it, Pierre Chang refers in passing to the polar bears being particularly suited for experiments in some kind of cold environment. And then it gets cut off, and you know the video does one of its jumps. So there, Dharma definitely huh. was you know, confirmed using polar bears to turn the wheel and see what happened. Um, secondly, yeah, with... With Faraday's sequence and him, you know, crying and not knowing why, I was thinking about that, and this is somewhat hindsight territory. The implication there is we, you know, later, you know, get out of his his flashbacks is, you know, he, you know, he has been doing time travel experiments on himself, um, and his own mind, you know, has been ravaged mm-hmm. and flashed back and forth through time. It seems, or at least he's tried to do that. So I think the the implication is that. He doesn't know why he's sad. He's probably sad because he, you know, some part of him and deep in his brain, you know, knows these people or knows what's going to happen or, you know, has some understanding that there's a connection between himself and what's happening here. But I was I was thinking about it more and more and thinking what would really make him, you know, tear up in that way and feel this immense sadness. And what if there's some, I mean, it made me think that there's probably some part of his brain that, you know, like knows that what this is going to lead to is him, you know, meeting Charlotte and Charlotte and then losing Charlotte eventually mm-hmm. um, and not being able to save her. I mean, that's the sort of dramatic denimo for uh, for mm-hmm. Faraday's character of, you know, he Charlotte dies and then he goes back in time or then he ends up, you know, going back to the island to try to save her. And it's, you know, it's very mm-hmm. tragic and he gets killed by his own mother and all this. But I, watching the scene, it made me think, gee, there's, it's even more tragic if you if you're willing to think that there's some part of him in his brain that that sees this and knows that that's all coming, even if he doesn't consciously know it. Yeah. Or he knows that it it could be coming. Coming being kind of a subjective word because of the nature of time, but yes. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. He's, he's on this Island in this moment, but has a sense of, I may have been here before, or I may be here again. And we don't, you know, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, and and I mean and, and watching the scene the first time, like, you really have no idea. So I think the scene is, is, is actually much more powerful in hindsight when you realize just how much you know, just how deep his sadness might be here, depending on um you know, depending on how, how deep you think it goes, what you know, what he might remember or what he might be connecting with. Mm-hmm. He yeah, uh Faraday's sense. got one of the, the most tragic arcs of any character on the show. Anyway, we haven't um, we haven't talked quite as much about the on island stuff. 
Oh, yeah. So, gosh. So three kind of distinct groups of people are established here. We've got Jack, we've got John, and then we've got Said and Juliet, um, who, of course, being two of the the savviest characters on the show, immediately figure out <laughs> what's going competent. on and leap into action, um, which is is well done. Um, also, of course, Saeed just knows how to fix a helicopter or, like, make sure it's still <laughs> working. Um, like, he and not the actual pilot. I guess we don't know if we can trust the actual pilot yet, but, like, Saeed just hops up into the cockpit and is like, yeah, it looks like it'll work. Okay. <laughs> go from there oh, yeah the reason that was on my mind actually now that i think about it is because because of the helicopter when um you know when frank is landing and he says they you know they have this electrical storm and it makes it so difficult to land i was thinking that that's our um that's kind of our first nod back to the all the events of the season two finale where we learned that leaving the island going to and from the island is not a straightforward venture that ben mm-hmm. tells michael you have to follow the specific bearing and we get the story from desmond about how he tried to you know, leave by going due west and he, you know, it's a snow globe and he just ended up back at the island. Like here now we have the opposite phenomenon. I think for the first mm-hmm. time since then, Frank tries to land a helicopter on and everything goes haywire. The instruments go crazy. It's like, okay, you can't, you can't just go to and from the island. Like right. I'd almost sort of forgotten about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you clearly cannot leave the island easily, which... Jack seems to be realizing question mark. I mean, he, mm. by the end of the episode, it definitely seems to settle in that like, this is not going to be as straightforward as we had hoped. And I, you know, he's already become aware of that, I think, but they, there's a, this one shot where he and Kate are standing and I, maybe Juliet's with them are standing at the top of the hill, looking down at the helicopter. And there's kind of a moment of like, oh, wow, it's really right there like our salvation is right there. Um, But at the same time, I think there's a sense it's closer than ever. And yet it's also further. It feels harder now than it did two episodes ago when all we had to do was connect to the freighter. Um, Like the logistics of this are going to be shockingly difficult. Um, Yeah. Which is why it takes all season. (laughs) I think it's also worth talking about Ben Yep. Um, I was I was just uh, you know Ben once again you know gets beaten up multiple times this episode just you know continuing on <laughs> what seems to have happened every episode for the last several. Mm-hmm. But he um, you know at the end of this episode it really seems like this is the end for Ben. Like Locke has decided that he he has to die. Like he's he's literally covered in blood. He's beaten and bloodied. He looks totally desperate, and his last you know like ditch effort is, I have information that you need, and mm-hmm. when Locke is coming over to shoot him, and it just it sounds, not knowing any better, which we do, but it sounds like such a desperate lie. Like that's what Ben always goes to. I have information that you need. It's like. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like this is, you know, this this is it. He's not going to be able to to talk and lie his way out of this one. Locke's really going to do it. He's defeated. And then, fucking lo and behold, he really does have information that they need. <laughs> and a lot of it. And it's just yeah, such, such a great twist to be like, nope, Ben, even at his lowest moment here, like, he really does have a plan and a way out of this. Well, and... And John also really changes his mind pretty quickly on whether or not he wants to get rid of Ben, right? Like, halfway through the episode, Sawyer asks him, like, why haven't we just killed him yet? And Ben's yeah. like, well, he might have information that we need. <laughs> <laughs> and then when John goes to get sick of him at the end of the episode and goes to kill him, Ben says, but wait. As you but said, I have information that you to need. To be fair to Locke, um, he doesn't just get sick of Ben. I mean, Ben shoots Charlotte in the chest. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's she, I mean, she's quickly revealed to be wearing a bulletproof vest. So yeah, you know, you kind of move on from that pretty quick, but yes, no, it but it, it does happen quickly. It's like it, 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 hap- it, it, es- what's the expression that escalated quickly. Like it happens yeah. very fast. Yep. I love that. Um, <laughs> that Locke's instinct when Ben says I have information is to go just to go straight for what is the monster. <laughs> <laughs> it's such also, a fan why? question <laughs> i understand that 
I understand why John wants to know that so badly, but like, is that the question we need to be asking in this moment? Like, <laughs> is is that the information you're going to extract from from Ben right now? And of course, he doesn't. But I, I thought oh, it was dear. kind of a meta joke. Like, if a fan could ask Ben any question, I think that's what oh, they geez, would have that's asked. Funny. Like, that's like the biggest lost mystery. It was too funny. But no, Ben. I just I just came away from that thinking like. Not only is it amazing that Ben talked his way out of this again, but like, it's amazing that he, I mean, not just that he talked his way out of it, he, um, I mean, he had this all set up, like, whereas we'll find out later in the Meet Kevin Johnson flashback, like, he's been planning mm-hmm. for these people coming to the island for a while. He sent Tom out there to recruit Michael to be a spy on their boat. And, and there are questions mm-hmm. about the timeline of that, and I know it's a whole thing about does the timeline really make sense? Would there have been enough literal days to do all of this stuff? But like, when you think about it, Ben, he really did plan for this moment. Like mm-hmm. this, this wasn't just a spontaneous thing he came up with. Like there's a reason I, I was watching it thinking it's amazing that this guy actually survives to the end of the show with all the people who want to kill him constantly. But that's because he really, he really does have this mind that is always like eight steps ahead of anyone else. Not always, but you know, so much of the time. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something that's helpful here is that they confirm that Ben is the target from both sides. Mm. So, you know, I think it's Miles who pulls out his photo and says, yeah. we're here for Ben Linus. And then I think it's in the very next scene or the scenes are more or less back to back where, you know, Ben, Ben shouts to Sawyer. I know what they want me, James. They want me. Um, which is we don't get that very often in Lost, I don't think. Especially with Ben, we don't get, like, third-party confirmation that what he's saying is true. Um, Interesting, yeah. So I think this is kind of a helpful, you know, we've known Ben at this point for a season plus, and I think most viewers have, by this point you have a little bit of sympathy, or at least you feel some sort of, complex emotions toward him as a viewer it's not purely like oh i hate this person and he's the enemy um but this interestingly is the first i think clear confirmation that there is a bigger bad out there yeah that's really interesting you know what i mean yeah yeah because up until now i mean ben has in a lot of ways, Ben, I mean, has been the big bad going back to his, yeah. you know, his introduction or when you find out that he's not Henry Gale to the end of, mm-hmm. of season three, where it's the battle between the others and, and the, and the survivors. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. you get Naomi landing on the island, but she appears to be there to rescue them. You're right. right. This, this is the moment where it's, it's like, there's something bigger going on here where, where Ben is not just the instigator where Ben is the target. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and at this point, it's okay to have a little bit of sympathy or, like, conflict toward Ben. Because he's not, you know, he's not just the person trying to kill our heroes. He's he is also running from something. and Right. Yeah. Running from something that I think, importantly, might also be dangerous to our, our you know, Oceanic 815 survivors here, mm-hmm. which might even put mm-hmm. them on the same side. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Do you, um... Do you have any hindsights? I think it's interesting that in this episode, we completely abandon the flash forward huh. for, you know, for 45 minutes of television. I mean, of course, we're going to go back to it um, and that's all going to be well and good. But it it's interesting that we did that for two episodes in a way that was very important. And it was like, oh, this is what we're doing now. This is going to be the format of the show. And then all of a sudden we kind of take a half step backward and do this kind of, kind of like a new type of episode, like a group flashback. I don't know if we've had that before. Um, Like I really, really liked this episode and I don't want to put it down, but it feels a little bit like formatically weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think that, I think it's interesting that Lost, I mean, like you said, they introduced this, you know, like crazy new tool of the flash forward and, you know, they they sort of spin it on you at the end of season three and then they start mm-hmm. season four. So it sort of seems like they're telegraphing that, you know, in the way that we had flashbacks before. This, this is how we're... this is going to go now. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but then, but I, but I think when you, when we look ahead to what, what actually occurs in season four, like we sort of realize that, um, 
that really what's changed here is not that it, in retrospect, it, it turns out to not be just like a switch from flashback to flash forward, mm-hmm. but a switch from flashback to just, you know, like this is going to be a flexible feature every week. <laughs> like, you know, we, yeah, that's this true, season is, we do have the constant coming up in two more episodes. Right. I didn't even think, yeah, the, not only the constant, but we have, um, I mean, the episode after the constant is a, is the other woman, which is a straightforward mm-hmm. Juliet flashback episode. You're right. The you're week right. after that is GE on, which is part flashback, part flash forward, which they don't oh, reveal until yes. the end. That's, <laughs> actually, that's actually the weirdest one. Um, then we get meet Kevin Johnson, which is like a full episode flashback. I mean, and, and you know, mm-hmm. most of the rest of the season is flash forward. No, but you know, cabin fever is also flashbacks. And then, and the season's only, 13 episodes yeah. so, so maybe, that's maybe half, half the season <laughs> yeah no you're, you're right and then i mean season you're, five goes all right. over I hadn't the place considered that yeah because i had always thought of season four as the flash forward season but it's really not oh do you have a hindsight oh yeah 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 um so I, my hindsight actually to, to go back to a, a scene that i've already you know like you know I, I rambled on this week is the miles flashback i think that in hindsight, this is actually a really important scene in a way that, hmm. you know, like maybe goes under the radar. I think the introduction of this character who can who can talk to dead people, like I know I, I sort of said, I, I said a version of this last week saying that the cabin moving was like the show telegraphing, like, you know, things are going to get weird and we're going to move outside yeah. of the realm of like, you know, sort of explainable reality. Mm-hmm. But I think the thing with Miles talking to the dead not only does it telegraph that in a really big way that we're, you know, we're moving into sort of surrealist territory, but, but actually so much of the last three seasons of the show is going to hinge on the idea of uh, some kind of consciousness continuing after death. Hmm. Um, we get, I mean, you know, Miles talking to dead people just sort of becomes a regular feature, but then we get Hurley talking to the dead as, you know, like an important plot device we get the whispers, um, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the answer about what the whispers are, and we see Michael. And then I think most most importantly, we get season six, which is all about the flash sideways and, um, you know, what, what happens to these people after they die and where do they go next? And there's, you know, their consciousnesses are, are still in this, you know, some kind of realm, you know, able to, you know, able to continue thinking and feeling and, and all that. Yeah. So I, I actually well, and think also, the, I mean, yeah. so much of season six also hinges on what we think is like the resurrected John Locke. Oh, so true. So true. And it's, it's of course not, but this, I, you know, we kind of at that point have been lured into this place of like, oh, maybe people do live on, on the Island and you know, it's not what's happening, but. No, but you're, you're totally right. And, and I mean, not that Lost hasn't, hasn't hinted at this before, like Mm -hmm. Jack seeing, you know, Christian Shepard and, um, you know, Charlie's ghost last week, which, by the way, s- several people reached out and said that they thought that it was very clear that Charlie was really there because another patient in the mental institute pointed out to Hurley that someone was trying to get his attention. I I still think that that's open to interpretation. Like, yeah. I think it's possible that that dude was in Hurley's mind as well. You know, there's other ways to explain it. But I, I just think that with, with Miles, you know, like this very straightforward, explicit sequence where Miles is in communication with the ghost of someone who has died, I, I think that's the first time Lost really says in a in a in a clear, straightforward way, like this is going to be a TV show where where death is not the end, where there's some mm-hmm. form of existence that continues after death, and that that's mm-hmm. going to be part of our story. Mm-hmm. And that that meaning and significance is is not clear right away here, but I in, in hindsight, looking back, I think that the fact that Miles can do this and why they've made Miles have this ability, I think this is really laying the groundwork for a lot of what's going to come thematically and emotionally. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And I think I think it almost makes more sense. That makes more sense when you focus on what Miles does with Naomi on the island rather mm. than kind of his weird ghost hunter for hire flashback. You know, he insists on being taken to her body because he will know what happened to her. And indeed, he, you know, it works. And we see, because in the flashback, you get one, you know, you you, you could interpret that. And like, oh, this guy seems kind of like a huckster. Like, I don't quite know about this. But when he does it with Naomi's body, it becomes very clear that it's real. And right. we are meant to believe that it is, this is a real ability that this man has. And and it it it's kind of... You know, his desire is to find out the truth. 
and he does and he acts on it you know he says they're right they're telling the truth leave him alone let's <laughs> take care of her body and yeah I think that, and I think that, well, also I think this is part of what makes Miles somewhat more sympathetic because it's interesting that they, there's something about the way he interacts with Naomi that, that makes it I th- makes it seem like he has some, some sympathy for her somehow. Maybe I'm mm-hmm. thinking of, I mean, the moment where he says, um, I mean, it's kind of a, you could be interpreted as kind of a cold line, but where they're taking her body away and he says, what are you doing? Like, that's just meat. That's not Naomi. Like, right. But, you know, he, what he's really focused on there is that there is a Naomi whose essence is still there, who's conscious, um, and and that that's not her in that, you know, that, that mm-hmm. body. I mean, that also speaks to the thing that's to come with Locke and the reanimation that, that you referenced. Yeah, so I think that's a really, a really good point, uh, especially as when we think about the idea that the man in black can inhabit a body and the soul is distinct from the body and the whispers are souls and... Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're playing in the right space there. Yeah. Glad I'm playing in the right space. I like that. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Confirmed dead. Good episode. Great episode. Great episode. We, um, um, we have more from our conversation with Rebecca Mader, who you heard from last week. Um, actually, she talked last week about a bunch of the scenes that we watched, uh, you know, this week, um, getting shot and falling into the, uh, falling into the water and all that. Mm-hmm. Um but our, our conversation this week moves, uh, you know, moves forward and talks about the the arc of her character in a in a larger way. It's a lot of fun. Let's go. Dan, the relationship between Daniel and Charlotte is so <laughs> complex, and you know, crosses so many like decades in the end because we we start time traveling. Like, how how do you see that in retrospect? How do you think Carl, Charlotte feels about Daniel? Does she love him? Does she just sort of have affection for him? Um, does she pity him? Yeah. How did you, how did you feel about that? I don't know. I think, I think I was a little bit as I think personally, I was a little bit disappointed that it became about that for me. Mm -hmm. I kind of, because my character was so strong that I didn't Mm want to just be someone's girlfriend. Do you know what Mm -hmm. I mean? I I felt like it weakened, it weakened Charlene's brand a little bit. So when it all became like, you know, Daniel and Charlotte and Daniel and Charlotte. It wasn't like, oh, I didn't want her to be in a relationship. But then sometimes when you're on a show, you get into this trap of people then shipping the couple. And it Mm -hmm. was less about my character. Why Mm -hmm. was she there? And what mission is she on? Because that's what really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. Um, God, what is his name? I thought he was my dad, the British Widmore. Is it Widmore? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, Charles Widmore. The the big villain. I I thought I was going to end up being his daughter, which I thought would have been interesting for me more interesting than dating Faraday. And like Faraday, I mean, he is such an amazing actor. He's so interesting and he was so, he's so believable. And he was so like, he just was like this physicist guy. Like, but it, I don't know. I mean, I think she had affection for him, but it, I don't know. I think for me personally, I kind of got irritated by it because it, it, yeah. it lessened sort of more the mystery of the show. I was like, I didn't, I didn't really care. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, that's interesting because I mean, they, cause they seem like they kind of like made some motions in that direction and then decided they didn't really want to go there mm-hmm. and never went, which, which is totally fine. It's just, it's, it's interesting. It's left a little open-ended. Mm-hmm. Hence the, uh, yeah. Hence the question. Yeah, just sort of dissipated. By, by the way, well, your, your character unfortunately dissipated. <laughs> um, but we'll, Time travels a bitch. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, um, I mean, you know, so interested in, maybe I'm skipping ahead here too much, but you know, your, your, the storyline with your death in season five, it, it plays out over a very like long, it's like five episodes at the beginning of that season where your nose is bleeding and then you're blacking out and your, your mind is flashing through time. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how did you feel about that storyline, you know, that, that you were killed off at that point and then the way they, the way they did it? Cause it's kind of brutal to watch, I, I have to say. I mean, enough time has passed for me to be brutally honest. I was, I was gutted yeah. because I was told that if I went into season five, I was going to be on the entire rest of the show. Mm. And then Ooh. they ended up upgrading the three guys and just then said they were going to kill me off. And I'm like, what? Yeah. What? Why? They're like, well, we don't really know how to write for you. And I'm like, there are so many different ways to go. What really screwed my character up was the writer's strike back in 2008. Because mm. I was going to have this big mm. flashback episode that they had spoken to me about. And my character was going to go in this different way. 
And I remember we were all on the beach and Jack Bender, who's one of the executive producers and directed literally 50% of the episodes, he was like the dad on the show. And he came onto the beach and he's like, shut her down. And like, Whoop! We all just had to stop and literally wow. just go and pack up our stuff and all come back to the mainland and just leave the island. It was so weird. And then just sit in LA and wait for the strike to be over. And by the time we all came back, they just decided to kind of wrap Charlotte up in a bow and you know, stick her under a dead Christmas tree and call it a day. So I remember, I remember when they called me to tell me that I was gutted and I burst into tears. I was in a pub in England with, with this some bloke I was dating. And then they upgraded the other three and I'm like, wait, the upgrade three men. And then the one bird gets Mm. chucked. I was gutted. (laughs) And then, and then I just had nosebleeds and died. I'm like, what? (laughs) After all that, I don't know. I just thought, I thought, I thought it was going to be way more for me, more exciting and more interesting. And I was in New York in 2000, 2010 when they were shooting season six at the end. And I remember I was in bed in New York. I was shooting a movie, an independent movie with Uma Thurman and my phone rings. It woke me up and they're like, hey, Rebecca, I've got um, Damon and Carlton on the line for you. I'm like, what? I hadn't been on the show for a while and they're like Rebecca and I'm like what's going on they're like well we were wondering if you'd like to come back we're going to doing this thing where we're going sideways and I said am I coming back for a nosebleed (laughs) (laughs) and they said no you're gonna they're like no it's to have sex with Sawyer I'm like when do you need me (laughs) (laughs) like running to JFK to fly to Honolulu (laughs) I'm here, I'm back. No blood. Woo. <laughs> and that was cool. And then and then I went back for the for the finale which was really 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 fun. That was one of the most mm. fun nights I've ever had at work in my life because the the very end was that concert um with Dominic's character where we were all together at the same place and no one had a complete script of the finale. They only gave us, because we always had full scripts, but for the finale, they'd only given us lots of different pages. I remember we all went and hid in someone's trailer and tried to put all the pages together so we could see what the finale was. (laughs) And then they ended up shooting like two or three different endings. So even none of us knew which ending they were going to use. It was, it was really cool. And we all got really drunk. It was a really fun night. Really, really fun. I'd like help some actors. It was just fun because you were all, you were all out there together, just actually like having a big party oh, and drinking. Like so, it was it so is what much it looks fun. Like I remember when they came to get us. Yeah. I think I was in Dom's trailer with Emily De Raven, who's still a very good friend of mine. Some other people like we're ready for you, and I'm like, have I said my dialogue yet? Because I don't think I remember it. I mean, we were wasted. <laughs> <laughs> it was like five o'clock in the morning. It was really funny. What are they going to do? Fire us? It's the end. <laughs> Oh, Gosh. Can't kill me now. Where, okay. where do you? The finale is is a bit of a controversial episode among Lost fans. What did you think of the way things ended? I really liked it. People go, oh, "What do you mean?" Yes, but they did this really cool thing in the end where, when we were all back in LA, and um, they sent. I remember they sent out an email, and they were like, um, "Finale viewing party, but secret location." And so we, and they said the location will be given to you like an hour before the event so that oh no one goodness. can find out where we were. And I'm like, so it's all very incognito. You can't get anywhere in Los Angeles in an hour. I know. And I'm like, heck? is it going to be rush hour? Because I might have to get a helicopter. Like none of us are getting there on time. And luckily it was in Hollywood. So it was really close. But it was this really secret private night, which was really cool. Because then it was just us. And then, I don't know, it was a really cool night and on this big screen. And I, I didn't think, excuse me, that I was going to be so upset because I wasn't in that whole church scene. So I, well, you know, I get there and like Terry Quinn, all the actors are there and stuff. And I, 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 you know, God, and the music and the orchestra and it's all going on and I lost it. And I'm like, keep it together, keep it together, keep it. And I'm like, this is embarrassing. I mean, there was studio network executives and I'm like, chips are coming out of my nose. And um, it was, I found the whole thing really, really, really moving. And my understanding of the finale, the way that, and I feel like even Damon and I talked about this because everyone's like, oh, it was all the dream, it's bullshit. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. No, I don't think that that's what the finale was saying at all. Like, my understanding of it was, and even Damon said this to me, like, whatever happened, happened. And then Benjamin and Hurley did stay on the island. That plane that took off, they did mm-hmm. get off. They, they did leave. So to me, to me, it made sense. And then everybody in the church, that was Jack's purgatory. 
Because the, mm -hmm. the reason I wasn't there was because my character wasn't important to Jack. So it was like whoever was sort of really in Jack's periphery were in his purgatory because he died going into the ether. So to me, it made complete sense and was really moving. Mm -hmm. And I was actually genuinely shocked that there was such a negative backlash. But I'm like, I'm like I wept for two days. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> but so many people thought that it had a dream-esque vibe to it, that mm -hmm. what the guys were saying was is it, it was all a dream after all that. And I'm like... That wasn't... I, I didn't think that that's what they were trying to say. So it's controversial. Definitely not. We, we on the hatch agree with your interpretation <laughs> of the ending. Oh, good. Quite, quite moved by it. Yeah, yeah. I like I don't, it. I, I, I don't think we would have gone back to rewatch the show and do a podcast <laughs> if we hated true. the ending, frankly. <laughs> good point. Go, you know, going back to what you were talking about, um, you know, before with, with uh, you know, your character's early exit, I guess what, what would you have liked to have been able to do with this character or to to see or you know experience with this character that you weren't able to like what where where would you have gone with it or where would you have wanted to I mean I think I would have had a more I would have liked to have had a more exciting reason as to why why I was there and and to be sort of mm -hmm. more involved in you know the the sort of mythology behind it in in a way and I don't know I really did want to be Charles Widmore's daughter I wanted to be sort of more involved as to why the island was weird. I definitely wanted to get chased by Smokey. <laughs> oh. That didn't happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess just more involved in the whole mysticism of it all. Because mm -hmm. that was really right. what turned me on way more than a relationship with a boy. Like, yawn, you can do that on any show, you know. It was, right. it was the sci-fi aspect of the show hilariously that became the sexiest thing to me because that was the first thing mm. I hated in 2004 but then come 2010 to me that was what I was most invested in was the mysticism of it and I remember I went to a viewing party at um DJ you know you know that really amazing DJ that passed away DJ AM Adam well he um he had a viewing party with all of these guys that were massive massive fans and I showed up to it and they're like, oh my God. And they were like sitting around afterwards and they were theorizing and they were all wrong and they're all theorizing and theorizing. And it was so much fun to watch it in like someone's home theater with a bunch of people that were so invested. It was, it was really cool to sit around and watch a bunch of geeks trying to figure it all out. And I'm like, that's wrong. It's never going to happen. <laughs> it was really, really cool. Yeah. But well, that's what was so could... fun about it for everyone. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Think for all the fans. It became like a water cooler you know, thing where everyone, yeah. did you see it? Did you, did you? And I, I wasn't a part of that because I didn't, for a long time, I wasn't watching it with everybody else. And then by the time I was watching it in real time, I was in it, so I'd sort of ruined it. Um, <laughs> but I think as a show, it's it it changed TV. I mean, there's so many shows that were like, like these pivotal moments in the industry. And to me, it was the first show that made it cool to like science fiction. Because back then you're like, oh, sci-fi, oh, only geeks watch sci-fi, and like only guys that live in their mum's basement, and you know what I mean? Like it used to, now it's cool yeah. to be a geek. Now everybody goes to conventions and blah, 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 blah. But back then it wasn't necessarily cool, and it, it made sci-fi mainstream. And I think there's never been a show like it. I mean, well, Game of Thrones to me is the only other show that's blown my knickers off the, in the way that Lost did. We are like, oh, shit, I didn't see that coming, and it's visually stunning, and... So to me, really, that's been the only show since Lost that has had that sort of much impact in terms of the whole world. It's become like a world conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you end up going on the convention circuit at all for Lost? Did you do Comic-Con or any of that stuff? I didn't do Comic-Con. Um, but then it was weird because, like, with with Lost as well, what's weird is that we've never all done a convention together. And whenever we see each other, like, why would we not do cons together? I think it was like we, we were a little bit ahead of that before conventions mm -hmm. became really huh. mainstream and really popular. Um, back then it was like Star Trek and things like that. And also mm -hmm. when when I was on Lost, I mean, that was when iPhones came out, for God's sake. I remember us all sitting around like, ooh, what do we do? Like, we're fascinated by these things that we were holding. <laughs> I mean, it was such a long time ago. And like, I mean, mm -hmm. twi Twitter was barely out. Instagram wasn't invented yet. So it's sort of like a little bit ahead of the whole curve of all of that. I think, you know, if Lost was out now, it would have been, there would be Lost conventions every weekend. I think it was just a little bit ahead of its time. So as, as much as I love the character of Daniel Faraday, I really appreciated um, Rebecca's approach to that storyline. Um, 
this idea that her character was super dynamic and super interesting and the love story felt a little bit, you know, like it didn't need to be the most important thing about her character. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I think I sympathize with it. Yeah, I agree. I, I appreciated her honesty about that. I think she, I agree she was right on about the thing that made her character most interesting. I mean, those things were very little to do with Daniel Faraday. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, re- re-watching some of the scenes between them prepping to interview her, um, either I think either the writers went in her direction or it was just the way she played it, because all the interactions between them where he's, you know, like, starting to get kind of sappy, like, she mm-hmm. she just seems she she kind of seems like she she pities him like she has affection yeah. for him but she's really it it it's very clear that she does not have the same kind of interest that he does like I think she's mm-hmm. yeah I am a little sad that she died when she did oh, and yeah. how she did it's it's a drawn out death and it's you know you lose a character who was really fun and refreshing and of course by the end you know we lose almost everybody but. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind no, of but a she's vulnerable right. way to go. It it sucks that they. I mean, not the, those. The, the Freighter characters were all great characters. Like, I have no, mm-hmm. you know, no issues with them keeping, you know, keeping Faraday and Miles and Frank Lapidus around. But I, I, I think she's right. It, 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 you know, it sucks that they had this fourth great character and they, you know, they kept the three guys on and they, they killed her off. It just, um, mm-hmm. it's a real shame. I would have loved to have seen yeah. her flashback episode. Like she, she said, they Me had too. it planned, and I, yeah. Um, thank you, Rebecca Mader, for, uh, for telling us how you feel. Yeah, we will play the final part of that interview next week uh, and then move on to some other great stuff that we've got scheduled for this season. Next week's episode, of course, is The Economist. It's a Saeed episode. We return to the flash-forward formatting here. In the meantime, you can always keep up with us on social media. We are at facebook.com slash thehatchpodcast and on Twitter at thehatchpodcast. And if you're enjoying the show, uh, we would really, really appreciate it if you could uh, rate us and maybe even leave a review, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, if, uh, if that's where you listen, or uh, wherever else you're finding us. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen, and our cover art is by Danny Roth. And we will be back next week. Namaste. Namaste.